Margaret Sullivan, thank you so much for being on the podcast. I know you're finishing up your own memoir, which is very exciting, but I'll keep this short so you can get back to writing. But first, how's it going? Uh, Well, you know, it's very challenging, as you know, Katie, um, and I've I've been reading your memoir and really loving it. When I saw the the title uh, going there, I thought, huh, I wonder if she does. And it turns out that you really do. And um, I thought that was terrific. It's such a it's such a great read. Um, so I hope everybody who's listening to your podcasts gets a copy of it. It's out soon, right? Really? Yeah, on, on October 26. But let's yeah. get back to yours, Margaret. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, you're, you're, is, yeah. tell me, how would you describe it? Is it a professional, personal journey? I mean, it's, it's, um, I think it's, it's about my life in journalism and it's kind of centered in part um, on my time at the New York Times as public editor, where I was kind of like the internal critic of the Times. And so it's about, you know, what led up to that for me personally and then what that experience was like. But also there's sort of a broader um, scope to the whole thing, which is that we're in a time now where there's so much less trust in the news media and in journalism and in the press than there was when I got into, when I first got interested in journalism, which was, which was at the time of Watergate. And, you know, I was so compelled by it. And at that time, you know, not everybody loved what they read, but they basically believed in the same set of facts. And we really no longer have that. So it kind of tracks that change from a time of generally accepted trust in the news media to now this incredibly divided country, divided press, and not much trust. So that's what it's about. That's that's so important and so needed and something that you and I have talked about and yeah. that I find extremely troubling because we're about the same age and came yeah. up at about the same same time. We could do a whole separate podcast on trust in media. Maybe maybe we can do that. But our focus today is really on local news because right. local news was so important to me coming up. It was so important to you, Margaret. Yes. Um, and before we talk about what your experience was at the Buffalo Evening News and um, sort of how you got into the business, um, why is local news so important because I've learned a lot about this from you, frankly, and I don't think people really appreciate not only how important it is, but how in danger it is of, of, of just, you know, uh, getting knocked off the map altogether. I interviewed you for an excellent book you wrote in 2020 called ghosting the news, local journalism and the crisis of American democracy. And as someone who really found her footing in local TV news and got invaluable experience from that. And I know you did the same in print. Mm -hmm. I I wanted to talk to you about your early career and the role the Buffalo Evening News played for a long time in your trajectory. So Mm -hmm. what was it like working there back in what, the 80s, right? Yes, back in the 80s. I came there straight out of school <clears throat> and, you know, I had internship offers at the two papers in Buffalo, which is my hometown. And I remember saying to my dad, um, should I go to work for the Buffalo Evening News or the Buffalo Courier Express? And he said, uh, I think he was a lawyer, you know, he's a pretty savvy guy. And he said, uh, I think the Evening News is the dominant paper. And turns out father knows best because two years, I did go to work there. They hired me at the end of my internship. And two years later, the Courier Express was out of business. So, smart, smart, yes, yeah, smart dad. So I stayed at the news for a long time, and I um, did every job. And eventually, I became the first woman editor of the paper, the top editor. And it was an incredible honor. Yeah, thank you. It was, um, you know, really. Even though I've now been, you know, I've worked for the New York Times and the Washington Post, and. I have more of a national scope now. I would still say that being the editor of my hometown paper and the first woman is really the privilege of my life. I mean, my professional life. I will call my children the, <laughs> the privilege of my Good other save. Part of my life. But, Good um, save. but it, you know, I mean, it was a big newsroom. There were there were 200 people in it. We covered an eight-county area. We really did the job for people 
um, in all of Western New York. And, and, and it was an exciting place to be. I was a, a politics reporter there, a government reporter, education reporter. And it was, you know, a tremendous experience. And then it's been, you know, it's been extremely difficult and painful to watch the withering of local news across the country, including at the Buffalo News. Although I have to say, I just spent a big chunk of the summer in the Buffalo area at a cottage on Lake Erie and I get the print edition of the paper every day. And every day I was like, wow, this is still extremely informative and important and well done. So, um, you know, it's kind of a split story. The ghosting the news thing is about places that really don't even have that anymore. And they've turned into so-called news deserts. So, and this is continuing, you know, since the pandemic, another 85 papers have gone out of business. And, and overall, there... it's been, you know, since 2004, it's been over 2000 papers in the country, mostly weeklies, but weeklies are important, you know, and some dailies too. So it's a really heartbreaking story. And to answer your question directly, Katie, I mean, I think that it matters so much because we don't trust anymore as a, as a nation, we don't trust in the press, but we do still have a great deal of trust in local news. So it's this weird paradox of, okay, well, this is the trusted, this is the trusted media, but it's withering and it's going away. Why do you think people do trust local news more than national news? I think yeah. I know the answer to it, but yeah, I'd like to hear your explanation. It, yeah, it's a varied, you know, it's it's got a few different aspects to it, but one of them is that, you know, these are people who live in your community. You could run into a reporter who um, maybe his or her child is in school with your child. You might know them from something that's personal and obituary of a relative. I mean, it's all very dug in in the community. And so therefore, when they tell you this is what's happening, you sort of have a personal connection to it. Or even if it's not a, a completely personal connection, you've got that sense of place. And I think that that goes a long way where the national media seems like, oh, you know, I think a lot of people feel like these are elites that are, they all live in New York and Washington and, and you know, California. They don't have anything to do with me and my life. Well, it's kind of true. It is kind of true. I mean, there's a very strong presence um, in national news in those in those places. And so, and, you know, I think we saw that very, very clearly in 2016, when the national press was so out of touch with the rest of the country and was like completely surprised that Trump was elected. Local news is not only critically important to inform a community, um, but it's also critically important because it it's sort of um, local the tentacles of local news really reach out into the community in perhaps some unexpected ways. Yes. So people not only learn about things, but it has uh, some some unintended positive consequences, doesn't it? Yes. And maybe I mean, they're intended actually. Right. Well, they. I mean, I think it is intended. It has a way, just as you say, of sort of knitting the community together. And so that could be a concert review. It could be a restaurant review. It could be a feature story on an interesting person. It doesn't all have to be heavy duty watchdog journalism, although that's extremely important, but it's, it's a lot of different things. And honestly, I have to say that one of the real disappointments um, that's happened at my old paper in Buffalo is that I kind of founded um, this section called Life and Arts. And it was the place where the, you know, the reviews were and the feature stories and the culture coverage. And that section doesn't appear in the daily paper anymore. And I really miss it. You know, there's still sport, of course, there's still sports coverage, right? But, um, and there's still, you know, political coverage and all of that local coverage, but that piece of it is diminished and that, that hurts. And I think that's one of the ways that you're talking about that we, you know, sort of intended or unintended. It's like, oh, did you see this thing? Did you, are you going to this show? You know, it's, it's more casual, it's more informal, and it's more the sort of the fabric of life. There's that. Then there are other things that go along with local news, participation in elections, mm -hmm. and also 
the investigative reporting you were talking about or the political coverage that you did as a cub reporter. That's right. Um, that actually keeps local officials in check. I mean, it there's does. a real there there's a real reason for that. Talk about those two things and the role sure. local news plays in both of those. So, you know, just having some, a reporter at a meeting, whether it's the city council or the, you know, town board or a school board, whatever it is, just having that reporter there, you know, I think it keeps public officials on their toes. It's sort of a way of bearing witness. Oh, somebody's watching. You know, um, I remember talking to the publisher of the Youngstown Vindicator, which very sadly went out of business two summers ago. And he said that, you know, it, it just really resonated with me. He said, when the paper was in its heyday, they were able to send a reporter or a stringer, meaning a freelance reporter, to every meeting in a three county area. And he said, they knew, meaning the public officials, they knew that and they behaved. And, you know, when that goes away, when you don't have that sort of person there who's, a, who's watching, then I think people, you know, there's a human nature. It's like maybe things could be snuck through in some way. Um, and then well, there's no course, watchdog, right? There's I no mean, watchdog. I mean, it's as simple as that. There's nobody there to watch. And while there are, you know, I don't think this is a black and white situation because even in places where the local paper may have gone away or, you know, maybe it's a weekly that's closed, you know, sometimes there's a radio station or a startup digital um, news organization that's still doing the job. It's not all about newspapers. And I think we need to always remember that. But having said that, newspapers are a huge and really, really important piece of the puzzle. What was the first sign when you were at the Buffalo News that mm -hmm. uh, it was a declining, not an expanding industry? Right. Well, you know, I was very focused when I first came in as editor, and that was in uh, 2000 that I wanted to increase the staff. So we had had a 200 member newsroom staff for a long time and I wanted to be bigger. I wanted to add people, add reporters and so on. And I got, made a little bit of progress with the bean counters and <laughs> then uh, things started to change. Circulation you know, started to go down. Um, the rise of the internet really started to, you know, Craigslist came along and really knocked the, um, you know, the legs out from under classified advertising, which was such a money maker. And, you know, I started to come under pressure to reduce the staff instead of to grow the staff. And that was, you know, that was really the sign that, you know, things were not going well. And there, and then it just, you know, then it got to be 2008 and we were in this great recession. Um, the whole country was hurting. And then, print advertising, which was the lifeblood of my paper and a lot of papers really, really started to go away. And then we had to make even more dire cuts, you know, started to do buyouts. We never did layoffs when I was there, which I was very proud of because I had hired all these people and I felt like they were family members. Um, but, you know, we, we didn't do layoffs, but we did do voluntary buyouts and we lost a lot of staff members that way. So all this institutional memory, stuff people knew about the community and what had happened, it was all walking out the door and it was really tough to see. What did those people do? I mean, some of them were a little bit older, probably yeah. more experienced yep. reporters, mm -hmm. which is, is really great to have on a staff, as you exactly. said, with that institutional memory. But um, you know, what did, what did a lot of those folks do? And so do you stay in touch them, with them? Yep. A lot of them were ready, were maybe a few years away from retirement. So they took a buyout and it gave them, in some cases, it gave them the ability to take their pension or their health care, you know, benefits or whatever it was and, you know, use that to either retire or to launch a new career. So some of them went into, you know, education, some of them um, went into PR, some, you know, people really didn't go into, they didn't stay in media because they probably were pretty dug into Western New York and there wasn't a lot of choice. Right. So they just, you know, they found other things to do or in some cases they retired. Well, let's talk about some of the, the other factors that have led to the disintegration, not only of local newspapers, but also uh, there are other, what about radio and television? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, TV has managed to um, 
hold on to its revenue and its business model much better, local TV, much better than local newspapers. Um, and that, you know, some of that has to do with the kind of advertising it has, and some of it has to do with transmission fees and sort of the nitty gritty of, of how TV gets its money um, that isn't as susceptible as newspapers to this decline. Um, and in some cases, I mean, I've been really impressed when I've been at um, investigative and reporters, editors, conferences around the country, that there are a ton of local TV people there who are really interested in investigative reporting. And maybe it's more of a day turn where they do a piece that has an investigative aspect to it or an enterprise aspect to it. Mm -hmm. But it's, you know, it's, that's part of how we're going to fill the gap. And then radio, you know, it's, you know, radio is, is tough to say public radio, I think is a part of the puzzle. And um, it's, it's, it has some pretty good ambitions for, for trying to fill that gap. What about participation in elections? Uh -huh. Talk about how that is so closely aligned with the vibrant local news ecosystem. Right. Well, there's, you know, there's a strong connection between a vibrant local news situation in a community and good political participation. And part of it is, do you vote? Are you active in your community in some way? Um, do you ever cross party lines when you vote? Or are you, you know, when local news goes away, people tend to go more into their sort of echo chambers, more into their tribes. And, you know, we've become very, very tribal. We're either this or that. And so people don't cross the party lines as much as they did because they're getting their information in many cases through, you know, social media and through a very sort of self um you know, self-sustaining idea, you know, you hear the same ideas over and over from people who are telling you what you want to hear, and you're not sharing this common basis of reality. So definitely political engagement, political participation, and that ability to sort of evaluate a candidate on his or her qualities rather than simply his or her party, that really changes when local news goes away. This vacuum that's created by the dearth of local news is one of the, what you're talking about. Facebook getting affirmation, not information, algorithms serving you up very similar, you know, pieces of information. Um, with that vacuum, I mean, don't you think that's essentially led to a lot of the distrust that you were describing at the beginning of our conversation? Yes, it's no, there's no question that it's part of the sort of whole disinformation, misinformation, um, you know, difficulty, I would say even tragedy that we're experiencing that, you know, people are getting their news from not very credible sources. They, you know, it's sort of like what it, it boils down to what your neighbors tell you and your neighbors may know what they're talking about or may not. But what they aren't doing is filing freedom of information requests, vetting the information. Um, you know, when a newspaper or a public radio station or whatever it may be puts a story out there, it had better be right. And if it's not right, they have to correct it and they have to, you know, own up to the fact that it's not right or they're going to really get hammered. Um, that doesn't happen on social media. If it's wrong, maybe you delete it, maybe you let it just spin out there forever. I mean, again, during the 2016 election, the, the amount of, you know, some people call, want to call it fake news. I think that term has been kind of stolen in a way. Well, I think um, it's a terrible term. I try to avoid it at all too. costs I because I think it began to, it started to be used by a president who considered anything critical of him to be fake. Exactly. exactly. And I don't use it for that reason too, but let's call it false news. So, you know, for example, a story that, uh, you know, the Pope had endorsed Donald Trump. I mean, that story was very, very widely circul circulated. It was viral. And um, once something is out, it's very, very hard to pull it back. It just doesn't work that way. What so, do they say? A lie makes it around the world while the truth hasn't even tied its shoelaces. Exactly. Yeah. Something and like that. Exactly. Right. I mean, it's, and you know, a correction does corrections don't even happen. In fact, some of that false news is done on purpose. I mean, a lot of it is so it, no one has any interest in correcting it or making it right. 
Let's um, talk about just sort of uh, other reasons for the decline real quickly before we get to solutions. Mm -hmm. um, you talked about the ad model, the ad revenue kind yeah. of cratering uh, with the advent of digital, et cetera, et cetera, and Craigslist. Um, but also what about ownership? I mean, you, whether it's Sinclair, which is a whole, could be a whole documentary or these private equity firms, you know, going for these newspapers and demanding profits. Right. Um, it seems the public service side of what a newspaper is all about has been forgotten in many of these markets. Right. I mean, there was a time when newspapers were owned by local families and that what, you know, didn't mean that the local families were always great owners, but they did have a stake in the community. Now, you know, most newspapers are owned by big chains and some of the big chains are actually essentially hedge funds or private equity firms. And they have very little interest, if any, in doing good journalism or even doing valid journalism. They are interested in sort of uh, harvesting the last profits that can be made from these companies, these newspaper companies, which by the way, are still making money. You know, um, it's not as if they're losing money. So there's profit to be made. They're gonna cut the staff, um, take advantage of the fact that there's still trust in these places and that people are still subscribing and advertising. And, you know, sort of, I mean, people call them vulture capitalists because they're sort of circling these properties like vultures and taking advantage of the last, you know, the last bits of value that are there. And a and lot of really, journalists are really saying, sad. no, we're, we're not going to do that, right? There have been big protests and there have been, but I mean, you know, your ownership is your ownership. And now most recently, the Chicago Tribune, the Baltimore Sun, the Orlando Sentinel, the Hartford Current were all bought by essentially by Alden Global, which is essentially a hedge fund. And it's really sad because these are storied newspapers that have done great work, won Pulitzer Prizes, employed, you know, fabulous journalists. And, you know, they're still doing the job today, but, you know, with fewer people and we don't know what's coming, but we have a pretty good idea what's coming because of what, what's happened in other markets when Alden has swooped in. Sinclair is a whole nother ball of wax, isn't it? it? Is. Can you explain to our listeners, because you are sort of the newspaper guru and the media guru, what Sinclair did with these stations and how sketchy it is? Right. Well, so Sinclair is the largest owner of TV stations in the country. And, you know, there have been times when it has it has a it has a conservative bent um, and there have been times that it has put out sort of an editorial that it wants everybody across its, you know, different stations to read. And, you know, there was one infamous case where, you know, it was, I can't, I think it was some sort of pro-Trump um, editorial that everybody had to read across the, you know, stations across the country all at the same time. And somebody did sort of a collage of, all of them doing it. I mean, that's not what you expect from local TV, which should be much more, obviously, much more local, much more individual, and not sort of, um, you know, proselytizing some idea that somebody wants to get out there. Yeah. And I think a few reporters quit as a result of it. And it sort of sounds like they're, they're taking a page from the Fox, uh, or at least what was once the Fox uh, rule book in right. terms of kind of distributing talking points for the day. Exactly. Right. That's, and that's something, you know, that is happening across the country. And I don't think people, you know, viewers of local TV, they, most people are not aware of that. They don't even know who owns their, who owns their station. Is it owned by next star? Is it owned by, you know, by Sinclair or somebody else? So it's, it's, you know, when this kind of starts coming at you, um, you may not be able to put it in context. So I think it would be good for people to just check into who owns their TV station that they're listening to. And is there an alternative? And, you know, is that or an ulterior really motive, motive, right? Yep, exactly. Yeah, exactly. you use a stat from, from Pew, from the Pew Research Center that shows 71% of people polled actually think 
local news is doing well. Now, this was in 2019, but mm -hmm. they're not only in the dark in terms of the ownership, but they don't even know that local news is in, is trouble. in trouble. Right, exactly. Well, why are they so really why are they so unaware, you think? I mean, I think it's because a local newspapers for such a long time were money making machines. And I think people got used to that idea that, oh, well, you know, the paper's fine. It's making money. It's, oh, they're making money hand over fist. And they just sort of haven't adjusted to the new reality. And that was one of the reasons that I really wanted to write my book, Ghosting the News, was to sort of sound the alarm. Um, you know, obviously it's not everybody read it or knows about it, but I, I hope it made a little bit of difference in raising people's consciousness. Well, what is what are the solutions, Margaret? Um, I know that 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 one of the things you're going to be talking about in your book and you've been thinking about because let's face it ghosting in the news was kind of a debbie downer margaret yes. <laughs> and, and there um i guess the question is a are there solutions and b what do you think are the most um you know potentially sound ones yeah well i mean it, it there's not one answer um but there's different pieces that have to happen one of them is i think that education and the schools would really um, could really benefit us as a country if they would start to teach a little bit of news literacy, media literacy in the classroom. So teaching kids, you know, I think as young as 10 or 11 or 12 year old kids, you know, how to tell a false story from a true one and how to read with some sort of, you know, critical reasoning. Um, and, you know, how to know what you're taking in is good or bad and, you know, kind of to compare and contrast. I think really basic information about that. It wouldn't have to be a full year course. It could be part of a social studies or something like that or civics. Um, so I think you could write the curriculum, Margaret, by the way. What's that? You could write the curriculum. I really could. I could sit down and write it today. Maybe after you're done with the book, you could focus on that and 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 work with with school boards yeah. to talk you about know, there that. There are some really good organizations out there. Um, the News Literacy Project, which is based in D.C. Um, and is run by uh, Alan Miller, who's a former uh, Los Angeles Times Pulitzer winner, does a great job with that. So, you know, there, there are some places that are trying to push it. So I think that's a piece of it. And I think that there is now an effort, you know, there's a bipartisan effort in Congress to try to get some indirect help, not a handout, but some tax credits. The Local to, Journalism Sustainability yes, Act. The Local Journalism Sustainability Act. They need Which, a good editor when they when it comes to know. coming it up needs, with that title. It needs a zippier name, let's yeah. face it. Um, but at any rate, it would give tax credits of various kinds to try to help local journalism stay viable. And I think it's it's pretty. I think it's pretty good. I've been really troubled about the idea of sort of government getting involved in this because I don't really want government officials messing with journalism, you know, journalism right. needs to be independent. But I think uh, we're at a point now where we need to look at things that maybe didn't seem like a good idea before and just to build some guardrails into it so that it can be done, you know, intelligently and, and independently. And independently, that's hugely important. There's also Report for America. Uh, Steve Stephen Waldman is the founder. This seems like such a cool idea. Is it is it gaining traction? And are a lot of people doing it? Tell us, yep. explain to our listeners what that's all about. Sure. So it's a little bit like the Peace Corps, um, in that it takes young people. I guess the Peace Corps isn't all young people, but it usually Report for America. Um, it it lets young people take a year. And it funds them to go into a community that has already has some local news, but it puts them in an existing newsroom so that they can sort of help and, and you know, broaden and sort of deepen their coverage. And yeah, it's grown a lot. Uh, it's only been around for a couple of years, but now there are, I think, I think there are, you know, at least a thousand, maybe more Report for America, um, I guess they call them fellows, who are in local newsrooms and, you know, doing a really good job. You know, I, I think that's another piece of the puzzle. It's not going to solve the whole thing, obviously. 
Well, how worried are you about training the next generation of journalists if there are fewer and fewer places to work? Yeah. And, you know, a lot of national places, some are growing, but some are shrinking. Yeah. Um, you know, I, it's funny because I am somewhat worried about it, but I also know a lot of young journalists um, some of them personally, one's my nephew, one's my, my son's ex-girlfriend, you know, people that I, and then some are my own students who I've taught at different places. And I'm always very, very heartened by how good they are, smart, um, you know, dedicated to journalism and really wanting to do the job. And um, so they give me a lot of hope. And I think that we might be in pretty better shape there than you might expect. There's another one to watch named Carrie Monahan. I hear there she's go. got she's got a lot of she's talent. got it, right? Yeah. What about this? I sent you an article about this startup called 6 a.m. that's yeah. doing sort of hyper local newsletters. I think newsletters are the new newspapers, honestly. Yeah. yeah. Um, and yeah, it, I, seems, it, it seemed pretty interesting. I mean, uh, I, it's one to watch for sure. I'm not sure how it'll play out. You know, there've been a lot of efforts, like there's something called Patch. Um, there's- Well, Patch kind of, didn't Patch not do well, Margaret? Yeah, I thought. I, that's what I mean. So sometimes these things kind of crop up and they look super promising and then they kind of fade away. So we'll have to see if this one takes off. Yeah, but I think at newsletters, that model is so interesting since we're so, you know, tethered to our phones. Exactly. You know, I miss it, the days where my, in your email. <laughs> when my dad was, uh, you know, at the kitchen table eating his Wheaties, reading the Washington Post and pointing out interesting articles or obituaries. Yeah. Um, right. You know, I, 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 I miss those days. But I think the good news, and I'm on this Aspen Commission for Disinformation, as you know, or to tackle disinformation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one thing that's been very clear to me with a very diverse group of people, the good old days weren't the good old days for everybody. That's and right. now with a new sort of landscape in journalism, it's become much more inclusive and the voices are much more diverse. So that's, that's a real positive, even it though is. the actual platforms are shrinking. You're right, though. The I voices mean, I are expanding. I, I think that's important to keep in mind that a lot of times the coverage that we got in these places that we wanted, you know, revere now and say how great they were, it was covering, you know, it was covering the, the white and the more affluent and the more establishment parts of their communities. So it is great to have a more diverse um, ecosystem that's hugely important. Before we go, and I know you have to, but let me ask you the question I get asked so often. What advice would you give young journalists today? Um, my advice would be you, you need to really want it uh, and really be dedicated if you're going to do this work. But if you are, then I think you have to, you know, have a really wide, read widely and read in a dedicated way and have a number of different skills, you know, not just one thing that you're interested in, but be able to be you know, certainly have the multimedia skills, but also have some different interests that make you a specialist. You can't just be a generalist anymore. You need to have some expertise to offer. So I think you're right. I, I, I always describe myself, Margaret, as five miles wide and half an inch deep. And I don't <laughs> so think that's good really be, good. Right. Now, hey, it served you pretty well. I don't think you should complain <laughs> well. or anyone should complain. So those are, some, you know, those are some of the things that I think are, are really important. And I would say that it's, it's extremely important work and it's really fun. Um, you know, you never have a boring day. You, well, you sometimes if it's a slow news day, sometimes it can it get boring, be. but, but it's really, I, one of the reasons I love being a journalist is I feel like I'm always learning something new. Yes. I'm always meeting interesting people. My horizons are always being expanded. And, you know, I mean, what, what a gift. It feels like you never stop going to school. It's true. It's, it's a great way to spend your life. So I think that um, I, I never want to be too discouraging with young journalists. I think it's great. And I, and I want to encourage them. And I do think there's a chance. I, I think there are ways to make it. And I think you're so right about having multimedia skills because, you know, I think about going out with the cameraman and the sound guy. And then, you know, I think the more things that you can do, the more self-sufficient you can be. 
the better off you are if you can take good pictures when you're covering a story. And now it's sort of like everybody's a journalist, which I think brings us back to the original problem that everyone thinks they're a journalist. Right. And but I'll tell you what, sometimes that serves us pretty well, as in Darnella Frazier, uh, who took the amazing video of George Floyd's murder as a you know, teenage bystander. Hey, right. Yeah. And as a testimony to what was unfolding there. And exactly. And the Pulitzer Prize uh, board recognized her with a special award this past year. So, um, you know, I think that citizen journalists can be really important too. Oh, clearly. Because as, as staff shrink, you know, you want people who are bearing witness to events. Exactly. And now because of our phones, everybody can can, you know, can everyone has the potential to do that. Hey, what's your book going to be called, Margaret? Uh, well, right now it has a working title of Fear or Favor, which comes from this New York. Neither Times fear nor Congress. favor, yeah, right? You're covering the news without fear or favor. So, uh, and then the subtitle is Inside America's News Breakdown. Well, good. It, it sounds very optimistic. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's me. You know, I try to be cheerful. <laughs> anyway, Margaret, thank you so much. Um, really, I've, I've really enjoyed getting to know you over Same these here, months. Katie. And uh, I really pre appreciate your work because, you know, uh, media organizations need watchdogs too. Absolutely. And they're, I always explain to people they're made up of human beings. They're not automatons. They no. have their own life experiences. They see three things see things through their own personal lenses. Right. And I think no matter how hard we try, sometimes, you know, mistakes are made. Right. And, and by the way, I mean, I was thinking about it in, in the current media landscape, it's tough because I was raised to be a reporter, not a commentator. Yes. And certainly in television news, um, being just a reporter doesn't cut it anymore. You have to actually have an opinion about what you're reporting. And that yeah. just, that goes against everything that I was taught yeah. as a journalist. I think that there's so much um, emphasis put on, you know, sort of building your personal brand on social media and elsewhere where you are expected to sort of, you know, walk a careful line. You don't want to say too much, but you want to have a personality. And I think it's tough. I think it's, it's a tough line to walk. Yeah, I do too. But anyway, Margaret, thanks again and good luck with the book. Thank you so much and good luck with your book launch. It's great. Thanks. Bye. Bye, Katie.